being uh, being the canvas. So the main thing we're going to do in this section is learn to multiply a matrix by a vector. To do multiplication like this. And let me start this off by saying, and we'll see why once we get to the definition, but you cannot multiply every matrix by every vector. We're going to have restrictions like this throughout linear algebra, and it's a difference from college algebra, where you can take any two numbers and multiply them together. To multiply a matrix by a vector, the dimensions have to match, by which I mean A has some number of rows and some number of columns. It might be square, it might not be square, it doesn't matter. But however many columns A has, the vector has to have that number of rows. So we can multiply 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 6 by 1, 0, 1. Because this is 2 by 3, and this is 3 by 1, and those numbers match. On the other hand, we could not, if we had if we just had 1, 0 here, now these numbers would no longer match. We'd have 2 by 3, and we'd have 2 by 1, and those that would be a mismatch. So this product is not defined. Um, the result of this multiplication is another vector, a matrix times a vector is a vector. And you see we've sort of, we've used two of the dimensions. Those inner dimensions tell us that we can do the multiplication. These outer dimensions tell us the dimension of the product. And in this particular context, I mean, a matrix times a vector is a vector, so it always has just one column. But this idea that one of the dimensions comes from this M, the other dimension comes from this one, will be helpful when we start multiplying matrices by other matrices, not just vectors. That idea will generalize, so it's good to get it down now. How many of you have Maybe none of you, maybe some of you. How many of you have seen a matrix times a vector before? No? Okay. So there are two sort of ways this material can be presented. And um, one of them, I think, is a little unscrutable. So let's go with the more uh, 
intuitive one first. And let's present this via an example. Let me start by saying dimensions match here. We can do this um, multiplication. We're going to end up with a two by one vector. So this is the first example of something we're going to see a lot in linear algebra, which is that matrices are frequently, matrices frequently amount to being vector storage units. And in particular, if we have a matrix with three columns, we're very often going to think of it in terms of having three vectors sitting next to each other in a container. A matrix times a vector is going to take these vectors in the matrix, it's going to take these columns, and it's going to manipulate them. It's going to manipulate them in the following particular way. It's going to take the first entry of the vector and the first column of the matrix, and it's going to multiply them together scale their multiplication. And then it's going to take the second entry of the vector and the second column of the matrix. And it's going to multiply them together, scale their multiplication. And then from the R pattern recognition has kicked in, we're going to take the third entry of that vector and we're going to take the third column of the matrix. And now we're going to add these things together. I mean, plus a minus three is minus three, so we won't write the addition for that. But we now have a bunch of scalar multiplication. We have a bunch of addition. It's a little tedious to do by hand. I mean, if this were like, 50 by 50, it would be very tedious to do by hand. This isn't so awful. So we get one plus four is five, minus nine is negative four, six plus zero <coughs> is six, minus three, is three. And there is our matrix vector multiplication. And this matrix vector multiplication is probably not obvious, and it's probably not intuitively clear why we would want to write multiplication this way. Um, like if, if you, we just gave you a blank sheet of paper and tried to guess what uh, matrix vector multiplication looked like, I don't know that most of us would come up with this. And this is sort of related to the idea 
in section 1.3 that you can have um, vector equations and systems of linear equations and those are really the same thing. Um, because vector equations and systems of linear equations, I mean, they're both turned into augmented matrices and they're both solved using Gauss-Jordan elimination. So, like, that, let's keep our, our number of equations and variables low, but uh, 2x plus y equals 3, 4x minus 2y equals 1. This system of linear equations can be reframed as a vector equation. This is x times the vector 2, 4 plus y times the vector 1, negative 2. equals the vector 3, 1. The system of linear equations and this vector equation are mathematically equivalent. They're both solved with Gauss-Jordan elimination on the same augmented matrix. So they have the same solutions, x and y. This can also be reframed in terms of matrix vector multiplication. This vector equation can be reframed as the matrix 2, 4, 1, negative 2, times the unknown vector x, y equals the vector 3, 1. Because a matrix times a vector is a linear combination of vectors, right? That's what we say in said in this sort of definitional example. A matrix times a vector is a linear combination of vectors. So you can go the other way and say that a linear combination of vectors is a matrix times a vector. So with our decision to define matrix vector multiplication in this way, we now have three different ways to approach the same, the same basic object. I don't, I don't know quite what word I was looking for there. But systems can be rewritten as vector equations. Vector equations can be rewritten as matrix equations. And no. we can also just go straight from a, from a system to a matrix equation without taking that pit stop. What we do is we just say, okay, well, the, this, this stuff over on the left is going to give me the matrix. This stuff over on the right is going to give me the vector. And in particular, these coefficients are the entries of the matrix in this vector equation. So 
I mean, this might make it seem kind of contra to the point I'm trying to make. This might make this all seem a little pointless. I mean, if you can always use systems of linear equations, then, then you don't need vector equations, or you don't need matrix equations. But depending on the situation, it's almost always true that one of these is going to be much more convenient to work with than the other. And in particular, it's really convenient to be working with matrices. I mean, those of you who have taken... Uh, differential equations, have solved differential equations with eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and that's a matrix property. Systems of linear equations don't have eigenvalues. Vector equations don't have eigenvalues. If that's something you need, then even though all of these might be formally equivalent, you really need to be down here in the lower right corner. So all of these have their uses, and it's not redundancy to present them all. And, and defining a matrix vector multiplication in this way whether it's kind of intuitive or not, it lets you do the eigenvalue stuff. It lets you do all sorts of really helpful things. So there's the definition. Um, here's the relationship between linear systems, vector equations, and matrix equations. Let me say that even if when you first look at that definition or that method of multiplication, maybe it's not super intuitive, it does have a very important property, which is that This multiplication distributes over addition. And the math majors in the room who are going to or have already taken algebra with Mr. Vogel know that multiplication distributing over addition is a property that we basically always want to have if we have multiplication and addition. You know, we have multiplication where order matters, where A times B and B times A are different. We have situations where there's multiplication, but we don't have division. In fact, we're going to see both those examples in this classroom. Uh, we can have like some properties that we're used to, or we cannot have properties that we're used to, but this is a property we basically always want to have. Um, and we'll sort of talk about this more in chapter four when we get to vector spaces. The idea that vectors and matrices together form a specific type of object, and this is a property they need to have in order to be that object. I mean, it's also just something that shows up in day-to-day -day algebra, like when we start working with eigenvectors and stuff, we'll want to work algebraically in this way. 
I mean, the second property is a. Uh, the thing is, I mean, work it. Look, I'm looking ahead of it, but when we multiply um, matrices by matrices and matrices by vectors, order matters. So, like, we can't have that A times U equals U times A. That's something we're used to having when we have multiplication, but U times A isn't even defined. It, it's, it's a meaningless statement. The best we can really do is say that when we have scalars, we can move the scalars around. And again, this is something that we're just, just going to do once we start working with matrices in earnest. We'll just move scalars around, probably without even explicitly mentioning that we're using some kind of special property. But this is going to be our justification for that. Let me, this is as good a place as any, it's, it's not quite in the order of my notes, but matrix times vector alternative definition. So this is how if you have, I mean, if you're just working with small matrices and vectors and you've got nice numbers, no ugly fractions floating around, this is how most people do a matrix vector multiplication mentally. That's Let's take this three by three matrix and multiply it by a three by one vector. And we should get a three by three matrix back. Again, how do I know that? A three by one vector, sorry. Again, how do I know that? Well, the dimensions match. So these inner dimensions tell us we can do the multiplication. And then these outer dimensions, that three and that one, give us the size of the vector we're going to get. I okay, so this method is entry by entry. Um, here we found all of the entries more or less at once. I mean, we wrote down the negative four before the three, just because we had to write down something first. But we did all of these scalar multiplications, then we did those additions. Here we're going to get the first entry, then we're going to get the second entry, then we're going to get the third entry as sort of totally separate things. And the way this works is you take that first entry, you're going to get the first entry from the first row. 
So we look at the first row of the matrix, and we look at that vector, and we're going to do some products, and we're going to do some sums. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply the first entries, one and one. We're going to multiply the second entries, zero and two. We're going to multiply the third, and my arms cannot bend like that. We're going to multiply the third entries, two and zero. And then we're going to add all of that up. So, because we're presenting this concept, I'll write all of these down, but the point, actual point of this method is to be doing stuff in your head and not writing all of this down. But we multiply the first entries, we multiply the second entries, we multiply the third entries, we get one, zero, zero, we add those together, we get one. And then for the next entry, well, we repeat this process with the next row. We multiply the first entries, one and one. We multiply the second entries, six and two. We multiply the third entries, three and zero. We get one, twelve, zero. We add them together. And that gives us the second entry of the vector. Let me separate these out. We then, one day, I will stop erasing stuff by mistake. Um, then we repeat this with the third row. We multiply the first entries. We multiply the second entries. We multiply the third entries. We get two and negative two and zero, and we add them together and we get zero. So this is sort of an alternate, alternate uh, multiplication algorithm. And it has its pros and it has its cons. And the pros are that it's fast. Um, I mean, again, assuming that you have relatively small uh, numbers, relatively small matrices, and your numbers are just nice whole numbers. Maybe the occasional fraction at the absolute worst. And what makes it fast is that you're not writing a bunch of stuff down. I mean, if you try to do this using the, the other algorithm, you'd have to write down 1 times the vector 1, 1, 1 plus two times the vector six negative, um, zero, six, negative one. Plus, well, maybe you'd recognize that zero times zero is just zero, but plus zero times the vector two, three, four. It, and then you'd have to do all that scale or multiplication, and then you'd have to do all that addition, and all of your steps are written down. Here, I mean, once you're used to this process, it's just... It's just, okay, 
one and zero and zero is one. One and 12 is 13 plus zero is 13. Two minus two is zero plus zero is zero. Once you have the algorithm nailed down, it can be extremely fast. The, um, the downside is that this presents absolutely no intuition about why we're doing this or why we would want to multiply a matrix and a vector in this way. I mean, when I was an undergrad student, I mean, it's, it seems astonishing, but it's true. My professor just defined matrix vector multiplication like this, and I was in graduate school before one of my professors finally explained to me, you know, you're taking these weighted sums of columns. That's why, I mean, that's what we're doing here. So it's very fast, maybe not super intuitive as a, as a method of first presenting this to students. Okay, and we are going to, I think, make, meet our goal of... Uh, of finishing this section. So, question. Does AX equal B always have a solution? for a given matrix A. So this is a good example of what I was talking about, of a question that um, is really easy to ask when you're thinking of matrix vector multiplication, but would be incredibly awkward to ask if you were talking about systems of linear equations. Like, compare does one, three, two, four, x equals b always have a solution. Does, let's see, one x one plus three x two equals b, 2x1 plus 4x2 equals, sorry, these should be b1 and b2, always have a solution. I mean, I guess the right-hand side isn't so awful, but it's definitely more writing than the left-hand side, if nothing else. So it's easier to talk about using the left-hand side. And then your answer is going to be, well, it depends on the matrix A. If A has certain properties, the answer will be yes, otherwise the answer will be no. And over here, there's really no good way to talk about this 
question. I mean, it depends on the coefficients, 1, 3, 2, 4, but any attempt to answer this question on the right is going to eventually dissolve or devolve into, well, take the coefficients and put them into a matrix and then study the matrix. So, you're going to have to end up over here anyway. So, this is a good example where even though systems and matrix equations may be in some ways the same thing, talking about one of them is a lot more convenient than talking about the other. So, I mean, I'll give you the answer, and then we'll talk about it. Ax equals b always has a solution if and only if every row of A contains a pivot position. Be careful here. Um, Sometimes when students struggle in this class, it's just because we have all of these theorems that um, are, or definitions that are similar but not quite the same. If every column has a pivot position, that's telling you that all of the variables are basic and there can't be infinitely many solutions. Every row um, having a pivot position tells you that a solution always exists. Why is this? Well, let's, let's look at this. with a specific A, just coming up with one at random. Does AX equals B always have a solution? If, in, if you had a specific vector instead of B, and you wanted to know whether there was a solution, we would be able to approach that using our calculator. We just use our calculator to solve the equation, and there would either be a solution or there wouldn't be. So why doesn't that work here? And how can we fix it? Well, the reason it doesn't work is that if we wanted to solve this on our calculator, we would have to give our calculator an augmented matrix. And the augmented part of the matrix is this arbitrary vector b. And our calculator can't look at this and deal with this. Our calculator would need numbers on the right in order to perform Gauss-Jordan elimination. And the secret here, or the key to getting around this, is if we perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on this entire matrix, 
were also going to perform Gauss Jordan elimination on the first, on the stuff to the left of that dotted line. So if we perform Gauss Jordan elimination on this matrix, who knows about those B's? Our calculator can't help us. But to the left of that line, we'll perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on that square matrix, and our calculator can do that. And I'm like 99% sure I know what we're going to get here, but since I did decide that matrix at random, let's be very uh, diligent. Let's see, if you're looking at this online after the fact, you're not seeing the calculator because I need to look at the whiteboard. But now, Let's share the calculator. So here's the, the part of the matrix that's to the left of the dotted line. Here's the non-augmented part of the matrix. Put out math reduced row echelon form A yeah, pretty much uh, in like the vast majority of cases, like 999 out of a thousand, really more than that. If you perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on a square matrix, you're just going to wind up with this. One's down the diagonal. We'll talk about why that is and what it means and what is happening to Zoom in a minute. Uh, new share. Get that whiteboard back again. We got one, one, one. Zeros. And we have no idea what this last column is. But we do have a pivot position in every row. So our theorem says this should definitely have a solution, and it doesn't matter what the last column is. Why is that? Well, we have to think back to a previous theorem we had about when solutions exist. We said that the only way for a solution to not exist is if there's a row of all zeros, but then that last entry isn't to zero. This is the only way we could fail to have a solution, because this would say that 0x plus 0y plus 0z equals something other than 0. So do we have a row that looks like this? Well, we can't. There's a non-zero entry here, so the first row doesn't look like it. There's a non-zero entry here, so the second row doesn't look like that. There's a non-zero entry there, so the third row doesn't look like that. So we don't have any rows that would stop us from having solutions. If we'd gotten something else, if we'd gotten this, then we'd have a problem. 
that third row doesn't have a pivot position, and if we have anything other than zero here, that would be a row that causes us to not have solutions. But because, of course, we don't have a zero, we have a one, that doesn't happen. And this, uh, this brings us to the end of the section, or at least it comes so close that you can do the homework, which is really what I was aiming for. So um, we, of course, are not uh, in this class affected by Labor Day, but I certainly hope you enjoy your long weekend, and I will see you Tuesday.